or Dr. Helen Rosevere, missionary to Zaire, tells the following story. A mother at our mission station died after giving birth to a premature baby. We tried to improvise an incubator to keep the infant alive, but the only hot water bottle that we had was beyond repair. So we asked the children to pray for the baby and for her sister. One of the girls responded, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late, because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, send a doll for the sister so she won't be so lonely. That afternoon, a large package arrived from England. The children watched eagerly and as we opened it. Much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Immediately, the girl who had prayed so earnestly started to dig deeper, exclaiming, If God sent that, I'm sure he also sent a doll. And she was right. The Heavenly Father knew in advance of that child's sincere requests, and five months earlier, he had led a ladies' group to include both of those specific articles. Folks, we need to understand that God always answers prayer. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's wait. But he always answers prayer. And so our goal today is to learn to pray God's will through abiding in the control of the Holy Spirit. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis. As we continue our study in Genesis, we're in chapter 33 of Genesis this morning. Beginning in verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in the front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God graciously has given your servant. Then the servants drew near, and they and their children bowed down. Leah there likewise, and her children drew near and bowed down. And last Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, What do you mean by all of this company that I met? And Jacob answered, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. And you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all of the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me, and at the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, Let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed on to Sukkoth, and built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Paddan Aram. And he camped before the city, and from the sons of Hamar, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land which he had pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we've been on quite a journey here with, with Jacob, and we've seen him be deceptive to Esau to the point where Esau is determining that he's going to kill him. And then his mother finds out about this and sends him away, and so he goes off to her brother, 
and he deceives it. And so they lived there for 14 years and then another seven years. And now God has told him to come back to the land. And so we reach that moment of truth for Jacob there where he has that, that confrontation with the man. And he's limping on his hip. And now he meets his brother. And there are, in fact, 400 men accompanying Esau. And as you might imagine, as Jacob looks out ahead of himself and sees that, in fact, you know, he heard the story that there are 400 men coming out to meet him. And so he prays. And we're going to look at that in a moment. And so then he determines that he's going to divide up his, his family. And it, instantly his, his mind says, you know, if, if he attacks the one, then the other will escape. But then he has this confrontation and he gets his new name, Israel, right? And so now if you notice in our text, what happens is he does divide the groups up. But rather than hanging back to the very back himself, he goes out ahead of them. And so Esau runs to Jacob and kisses him. Whew, right? You didn't know. So they exchange pleasantries and, and Esau surveys Jacob's family. And then Jacob gives him this huge gift. And we read about that in, in our passage. Uh, all of these flocks and all, all of these servants and so forth that Jacob is giving Esau. And Esau tries to refuse the gift. But Jacob won't have anything to do with that. He continues to insist that Esau take the gift. Have you ever tried to give a gift to anyone half-heartedly and you're like, well, you know, I, I, you know it is their way. <laughs> or, or, yeah, you know, I, they, they did do me that favor. And so you, you, you half-heartedly try to give them the gift and they're like, no, 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 you don't have to do that. And you're like, okay, cool, no problem, right? Because you really didn't want to give him the gift in the first place, right? But no, what you see here is that there's an insistence on the part of Jacob to give him the gift. And so Esau's like, well, no, you don't have, I have plenty, I don't, I have plenty. But think about it, could, could Esau be testing Jacob? Could he be testing him? Because, you know, all the way back there in, that, in, in his mind, I mean, have you had people in your life that have deceived you? Have, have you been in a situation, and of course he deceived him twice, right? Messed him over twice already now. And so, yes, it's been years. Yes, they seem to be exchanging pleasantries and so forth, but could he be testing him? You know, a story goes that a number of years ago, the Douglas Aircraft Company was competing with Boeing to sell Eastern Airlines its first big jets. War hero Eddie Rickenbacker, the head of Eastern Airlines, reportedly told Donald Douglas that the specifications and claims made by Douglas's company for the DC-8 were close to Boeing's on everything except noise suppression. Rickenbacker then gave Douglas one last chance to outpromise Boeing on this feature. After consulting with his engineers, Douglas reported that he didn't feel that he could make that promise. Rickenbacker replied, I know you can't. I just wanted to see if you were still going to be honest anyway. Have you ever had anyone test you like that? It's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? You know that. I mean, a, a person already knows the answer to to the information that they're asking you, but they're testing you to see if you're going to be honest, if you're going to be truthful. Could that be what's going on here with Esau? Nevertheless, what we see here is the gift is offered, and he continues to press Esau to take the gift, and Esau receives that gift. Jacob is different. He's a different person now. He has a new name, and he's, 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 he's a different person. He demonstrates his integrity here with Esau. So then Esau goes on to offer Jacob an accompaniment, but Jacob refuses it with a sound reason. But is that the real reason? Could Jacob be still concerned that maybe something might occur, maybe he'd say something wrong or, or what have you? So anyway, Esau goes to Seir, and Jacob says, hey, yeah, I'll meet you in Seir, but he doesn't go there. He doesn't go there. So Jacob settles in Sukkoth, and he goes to Shechem and buys some land. Now, Sukkoth is just a little bit north of Shechem. So what we see there is, and I was, as I was reading that, I was like, wait a second. It says Sukkoth, and then it says that, that Shechem. So I was reading, I was looking at the geography, and I don't know if y'all are map nerds or anything, but it's very interesting to have like a, a Bible atlas because you can look at the Bible atlas and you can see where all of these places are. And I, I didn't do a Bible atlas because it's not that, really that big a deal, but this is just north of Jerusalem. 
these two areas here. So he, he comes to Sukkoth, and then he ends up buying some property just a little farther south than that in Shechem. And we're going to see uh, what, what this error brings, uh, brings Jacob in uh, our, our next couple of weeks here. But that's where he settles, and he does buy the land. So he's finally back in the land of Canaan, safely, as promised. God promised him that he would return to the land safely, and God makes good on that. And so Jacob erects this altar and calls the place El Elohi Israel, which is God, the God of Israel. And so now, guess what? Remember all of those weeks where we're talking and we hear Jacob saying, the Lord your God, and then he says, if you'll do this, I'll do that. We see this, this progressive sanctification of Jacob and then last week we saw where God gives him a new name and he's a new person now and, and we see that demonstrated by his integrity here but we also see it by the fact that he erects a, an altar and calls it God the God of Israel in other words he's, he's saying this is my God now because of course his name is Israel Notice that we're seeing a different Jacob here in chapter 33. He continually gives God the glory for everything. Go back and look at verse 5. Verse 5, he gives God the glory for his children. And then, then and look down in verse 11. He gives God the credit for his wealth. And then in verse 10, he, he, he notates that even the joy of getting to see his brother again is like seeing the face of God. Of course, that's a simile. He's not seeing the face of God. He's saying that if he saw the face of God, he would be joyful. And he's expressing that in the way that he is joyful about seeing his brother again. The bottom line is the old Jacob struggled with God and man. The new Jacob finds favor with God and man. But what does this segment reveal about God? I think, I think you have the clue there. You know, generally I like to give the one main point in advance in a story so we get the the idea, and we're framing up what we're going to look at today, but we need to go back to chapter 32, and if you look in chapter 32, and in verse 9 and following, it says, and reminding us, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do your good. I am not worthy of the least of all of the deeds of the steadfast love and all of the faithfulness that you have shown your servant. For with only my staff I crossed the, this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Here's the prayer. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. God answered Jacob's prayer. God made good on his promise. Because you see, friends, God is faithful. He always does what he says he will do. God always does what he says he will do. Now, prosperity gospel will take this and they'll twist it and they'll say, oh, if you, if you ask for anything in earnest, you know, if you have enough faith, then whatever you ask for, God will give it to you. Is God a vending machine? No. Is he a genie in a bottle? No. Is he at our beck and call? No. God is the sovereign God of the universe and God's purposes will be fulfilled and God is playing out these purposes in the life of Jacob and making good on his promises to fulfill his purposes in his way for his glory. Amen. And so, the takeaway that I want us to have today is to look at what the Bible says about prayer. What the Bible says about prayer. The first thing I want us to look at, though, is how to prepare. Because you see, friends, when we begin to draw near to God, when we begin to seek God's face, when we begin to seek that audience with God and seeking to draw near to Him, the enemy doesn't like it. The enemy will constantly attack us. The enemy will constantly find ways to throw a monkey wrench into the works here to stop that. So turn with me over to the book of Ephesians. And let's begin in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, and in verse 10 and following, the text says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. 
Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Notice there, I'm going to pause for a second. Notice that at the beginning of, of verse 16 there, it says, in all circumstances. In all circumstances. It's not just when you're feeling attacked, friends. It's in all circumstances that we're putting on the armor of God and that shield of faith. And it's verse 17. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying every once in a while when things go bad. Oh, no, wait, it doesn't say that. At all times, in the Spirit. How? In the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Big S. In the Holy Spirit. We're praying in the Holy Spirit. With all power, prayer and supplication to that end. To what end? Praying at all times in the Spirit with all power, prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Supplication is just another fan a fancy word for interceding for others. Interceding for others. For what? For all the saints. For all the saints. And also... For me, you know, the Apostle Paul, who's that? He's their spiritual mentor, their spiritual leader. So we're praying for the spiritual mentor, the spiritual leader. That the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. And friends, that would be my prayer. That you would do that for me. That you would pray for me in that way. That what it says here. That the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Please pray for me in that way. For which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. So we're putting on the armor of God here and preparing this for what's to come. The attacks of the enemy. Flip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 with me if you will. Over in the T's. <coughs> Excuse me. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, says this. Rejoice when things are going well. Oh, um, it doesn't say that. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks when God blesses you. Oh no, it doesn't say that. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I'm going to back up for a second. Rejoice always, no matter how well we perceive things to be going, or no matter how poorly they're going. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? That means that's, a, that's an acknowledgement, friends, an acknowledgement of that connection, that omnipresence of God who is everywhere present in time and in space, the acknowledgement of his presence and his involvement and his sovereignty in all things and everything that we're doing, every moment of every day, that recognition of his presence and his sovereignty and his involvement. Pray without ceasing. And then continuing, giving thanks in all circumstances. Friends, we've had some very, very dire circumstances. All of us have had some very, very tragic experiences in our life. But the text reminds us here that we are to give thanks in all of those. How do you do that? How do you do that? Only by the power of the Spirit of God. Only by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Can he lift us up in that way? For why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What is the will? To rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in all circumstances. 
Those are our prayers. Those are lifting up prayers. You know, we get this idea that prayer is just coming to God with this laundry list of things that we want. When you have a prayer, hey, we're going to have a prayer meeting. We have a prayer meeting. The first thing out of the person leaving the prayer meeting's mouth is what? Does anybody have any prayer requests? Right? And then we're talking about, you know, fix this. Uh, you know, help me get this job. Uh, help, help me get this loan for the house. You know, heal, you know, heal, heal my, my hangnail. All, all of these requests and so forth. Like, what does the Bible say about prayer? Let's keep going. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Dial over one book. To 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And notice he wraps it up. You know, of course, he, he gives a greeting and then he, he, you know, he talks about the judgment of Christ coming and the man of lawlessness and standing firm. And then he says, finally, brothers, pray for us. Who's us? Well, he says, Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, and he's writing to the church of, uh, of the Thessalonians. So he says, pray for us. So he, he, we see in the greeting who he's asking for prayer for. The, that the, what are we praying for? for? For ease and peace and joy and, and no problems. No, that's not what he says. Look what he says. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. So what does he say? He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread and be honored, and that we'll be protected from those that are trying to trip us up. Prayer. Prayer. Let's keep going. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 there. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, remember I said supplication is just a fancy word for interceding for others. That supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for the people that you like. No, no, it says all people, for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. We are to pray for our leaders, friends. Do you pray for your leaders? I hope you do. I pray that you do. I pray that you do. And thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all in high places, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in most ways when you're around other Christians. No, it doesn't say that. No, no. What? To be dignified in every way. That may lead a peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God for our, of our Savior who desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Oh, I hope you pray for salvation for those people in your life who are lost friends. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, for what? What, do you, what all he just said. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also. And I, I, I'm going to stop there at verse 8. Let's keep going. And remember that, that folks were, were, his disciples were like in awe of how Jesus prayed. And they're like, teach us how to pray, Lord. Over in Luke chapter 11, remember how he started off. Teach us how to pray, Lord. In chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to this, when you pray, pray like this. He didn't say pray this. You know, and it's called what we call the Lord's Prayer. Now he didn't say pray this, he said pray like this. Pray like this. That's again, that's a simile. It's a description of the template of prayer. And if you look at that, the, the first half of it is 
praise and honor and glory. He is worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And the second part of it is we are needy. But it's a specific kind of, uh, of need that, he, that he's praying for there. But look at how Jesus prayed. Look, go, go back to, to chapter 6 in, in Luke. I hope you held your place there. And in chapter 6, there in verse 12, look at what he says. Luke 6, 12. In these days, he went out on the mountain to pray. And for five minutes, he continued. Oh no, it says, and all night he continued in prayer to God. This is God incarnate. This is the God man. This is the second member of the triune God, and he's praying all night. Do we have an ardent desire to pray, to commune with God, to talk and to listen? You know, the thing about prayer is, you know, we get this idea that it's this monologue where we're talking to God. You know, he's God. We probably ought to let him begin the conversation. It's a dialogue. Let him begin the conversation with his word. He speaks to us, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his son, speaking to us. Pray the word. Pray the word. Let's continue. Drop down a couple of verses there in chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. In Luke 6, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good for those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. Pray for your enemies. Do you do that? Do you pray for your enemies? And so, if we dial up a couple of chapters there in uh, Luke chapter 22, I would call this the real Lord's Prayer. Feel free to criticize me for that. I know not so much here that you don't go to lunch and have roast pasta or so, but that's all right. Are you awake? Are we here? Are we still here? Come on now. All right, the real Lord's Prayer. Luke 22, verse 39 through 44. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew them from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. What cup? He's talking about the crucifixion, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know, people say, oh, he sweat blood. That's not what the text says. The text says he sweat like great drops of blood. That's a simile. Have you ever prayed so ardently for something that you were sweating? Have you ever? The real Lord's Prayer, friends. I know I'm going to be going through this. If you're willing, take it away. But not my will. Your will be done. Praying the will of the Father. And so here's my challenge this week. In our daily quiet time. I'll give you some final instructions concerning our expectations for prayer. There in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Over in Philippians 4. says this. You know, I don't mark my place because I give you a chance to get there too. Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds 
in Christ Jesus. Notice what it doesn't say, friends. Notice that it doesn't say that by doing that, all of your problems will be taken away. Pray in that way, friends. And so I want to give you a template. We've talked about this before, and I share this sometimes in a Wednesday night, and I think I've mentioned it a couple of times. But it's very easy to remember this acronym to pray, ACTS. A-C-T-S. A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication or intercessory prayer. And so we begin our time of prayer by letting God begin the conversation. Study His Word, go into His Word, and draw something out of that and praise Him for it. Lift up holy hands and, and praising God. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present in time and in space. He's omnibenevolent. His way is the best way. He's immutable. He never changes. The reason He never changes, friends, is because He's infinite. And all of his qualities exist in a perfect balance of infinite. He's eternal. He had no beginning. He had no end. He's perfection. He's truth. He's holiness. He's goodness. He's love. He's righteousness. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He needs no one. He's the creator of all things. And what an amazing creation this is. This is the flawed version. And look how beautiful everything is. It's amazing. Think what heaven's going to be like. You know, in your confession, as we confess our sins, omission, things you've left off, Things you should have done that you know you should have done because you're, you're indwelled with the Spirit and, and, and you know He charged you to do it. You didn't do it. Omission. Commission. Things you did you shouldn't have done. Wrong motives. Things you did might have looked right on the outside, but that motive underneath, oh no. It was not a good motive. And then wrong attitudes, you know. And, and, the, and those are the things that undulate in the background. That, 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 eat, us, that eat us alive. Those, 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 those unloving attitudes that will, that will just confess those things and bring them before the throne, knowing that as far as he's from the West, he's so far removed our sin from us, and that you're forgiven for that. And thanksgiving, oh my goodness, so many things we could be thankful for, on and on and on and on. We could sit here and list them day in and day out and, until the kingdom come. But if it's nothing more than the fact that he regenerated you and that you'll spend eternity with him, sufficient to be thankful for that supplication, People in your life, friends, those relationships, those communications that you have with people that have needs, lift those up to the Lord. Place them in His capable hands and ask Him to answer them in His grand sovereignty, His grand design. Praying acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication in your daily quiet time. It'll be a robust time that you have with the Lord. I promise you it will. Thank you. Let's pray.